Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Insights with Experts. Today, we are very happy to have with us Jin Rong. How are you today, Jin Rong? I'm great. Thanks, Jonathan, and thanks, Sham, for having me. So to kickstart the interview, maybe you explain a bit more about what you do with Founder Napi, with Risk House, and right. with NTU. Oh. Right. Thanks, Jonathan. So I guess a um, big part of what I'd like to share today probably starts with Considerate. Right. It's a social enterprise that I've started, which um, in light of the COVID-19 disruptions, um, hope to essentially connect people who need help with those who can help. I feel that in times of crisis, um, everyone really needs to stand together to, to really like stand as one, and that's how we can overcome the crisis together. Um, apart from that, like maybe a brief intro of some of the other stuff that I'm doing. Um, as you should say, I co-founded Anapi. It's an intro tech startup where we basically um, provide, uh, we help startups and we help uh, entrepreneurs to get like um, the right coverage that they need um, in the most efficient manner possible. Um, at the same time, I'm also the director at Risk Lighthouse. Um, Risk Lighthouse is a risk consulting firm that's founded in 2005, more than 15 years ago. Um, basically, what we do is that we specialize in advising government agencies, MNCs. Um, a recent project that we are working on right now is that we are um, working on this. We are, we are advising like uh, the ASEAN member states on like catastrophe risk, right? In a one-liner, essentially. And yeah, at the same time, I'm also uh, an adjunct faculty um, and I lecture part-time, which I, I basically lecture part-time at both um, Singapore Management University, SMU, as well as Nanyang Technological University, NTU. And yeah, basically things I teach, I teach like uh, econometrics, um, data science, actual science, as well as like finance and whatnot. So yeah, that's basically... Oh yeah, and I'm getting married next year, so something interesting. But yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I think what's really, really nice to hear from, from all of that is you really like to just give back in any kind of way that you can. I mean, yeah, you were talking about that in terms of like even school talks, conferences, even the social startup, which you have as well. So I wanted to perhaps focus a little bit on that now for this part. And essentially, I want to ask two questions. Firstly, why do you think it's so important that we should keep every uh, way that we can and secondly how do you think we can maybe foster an environment where more people uh, feel that they can help other people a lot more I guess that's great so yeah I think those are really valid questions um, especially for the second one like how do you really encourage an ecosystem where we get people to help one another right um, for that I actually have um the, the way I actually look at it, I actually talk about this problem a lot of time. Um, I feel that a big part of giving back is out of the goodness of your heart, right? Like you really just want to help people. And there's this um, Chinese saying where when you help people, you shouldn't like brag about it, right? Because that shouldn't be the focus of helping people. Um, and that's essentially what I believe as well. Um, but um, I actually thought about that. I feel that if we really want to get more people to help one another, should there be actually a shift in mindset, right? That's something that I actually thought about a lot. And I feel that if we can actually start really, start by giving recognition to people who's helping others, right? By making that very simple um, shift in mindset, um, what we can actually do is um, we, actually, we can potentially really encourage a lot more people to help others, right? Some of them would definitely still be doing out of the goodness of their hearts. But at the same time, some of the others, they may be actually doing it out for, for the need for recognition. We can't deny that, right? But at the end of the day, what do we actually really gain out of it is that these people who are even doing it, who, who are helping others for the recognition of it, at the end of the day, they are still helping someone else, right? At the end of the day, helping someone is, the way I look at it, is someone who has something, right? Um, helping someone else without um, asking for anything in return for the person who, who needs the thing in need. Right. Um, so essentially what happens here is um, in the way if we look, because I'm like uh, at the School of Economics, and, um, so I try to look at things from a more like rational way, from a more econ's way of looking at stuff. I feel that if we can actually, uh, for these people who help someone else, right, um, even if they are doing it out for, the, for like recognition or whatnot, um, by the end of the day, they are indeed transferring some of their resources that they actually have on hand to someone who really needs them. 
right? So I feel that if you're able to generate that sort of recognition, that sort of um, in a very subtle way, right? And that's essentially what I'm trying to do with consider actually. So I feel that um, you are spot on. Like uh, at considerate, we we are starting to introduce um, like some recognition, like where, for example, we have person A helping person B. Then for person A, we'll say like, um, we have his name there. We'll try to give him some recognition. And um, it's like an experiment that I'm testing. out. Everything is still, still um, we're still working on it. But I feel that that could be a step in the right direction to fostering an ecosystem where we really have more people helping one another, right? I feel that it will be a virtuous, virtual cycle, uh, cycle essentially. Mm -hmm. And as for, I guess your first question, if I recall correctly, is basically like, um, what motivates me to like give back um, to, to the society and everything. I feel that for me personally, um, I've done many things. Like um, I've tried several different stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, I feel that when you are helping someone, um, they actually, like all the things that I do, it brings me like joy, right? I feel excited when I solve a difficult problem, um, when I encounter an issue at the company, and when I solved it, I feel like, I feel like, yes, I, I, I did something, right? Like some, some, something new today as well. Uh, but for consider it, I feel that whenever, whenever I spend my time, right? Making someone else's life better, um, it also brings a kind of joy. I, I'm happy about that as well. But the type of joy that it brings about is actually kind of different, I feel. Like it brings a different type of happiness. And that for me is the, the fundamental motivation, right? For me, um, I have done um, many odd jobs as well, right? Back when I was an undergraduate, when I was in high school, um, like I, the standard ones, like giving flyers, like waitering to I sweat floors as well. And being in those um, positions actually taught me like the importance of empathy, right? Like being in their shoes, like really, I recommend everyone to really just go out and do it like being in their shoes for like even a week or month or even just a day um it's really an eye-opening experience and it taught me so much about um never judging someone else and the importance of being more empathetic towards others and really helping them where you are able to so that's um fundamentally where i that i guess that's my motivation like that that special kind of happiness and being more empathetic to those around us yeah yeah, I wanted to really quickly talk about that first answer, which you gave, and I found it really, really interesting, because I recently read this book right here. Um, right. Nice. And, I mean, I'm quite, I mean, I'm quite sure that you're familiar with the actual author and everything like that. But essentially, he talks about uh, in this one chapter of that book, essentially, how can we motivate people to actually do good deeds? That's things like, you know, how can we motivate people to, for example, care about the environment, help other people? And what he talks about is exactly what you talk, talk, talked about, as opposed to extrinsically motivating people with like a progressive tax system or anything like that. You should instead intrinsically motivate them, make it seem like it's a genuinely good thing. And so with the environment, as opposed to placing a carbon tax on a company, just get all these companies to post the amount of carbon they emit every, every year. So if you make it a social thing, then it kind of incentivizes them to intrinsically motivate themselves. Yeah, so for the next question, going back to what you do with SMU and in terms of your teaching mm. and whatever, yeah. the next question would be, how do you, uh, from a speaker's perspective, keep your students engaged? And this can be both for a sort of formal like education teacher-student relationship, but also for like informal speaking and conferences and events, pitching to investors, projects, whatever. How do you keep the level of engagement and drive attention to your content? That's a, another great question. I've been um, it's something I, I've been giving presentations um, for many years now. Um, I've tried different styles. Like I feel that um, for me personally, I feel that the like at the end of the day is being genuine, right? Like if you are being honest about what you are sharing, um, I feel that the audience they can really feel you. So if I may be frank, like like what I'm doing now, like being genuine about the things that I'm sharing. Uh, for example. Um, with my students um, for my teaching, right? Um, when I'm doing my teaching, of course, I go through the syllabus, I go through all the key information and content that the, the students need to know, right? Cause it's like part of their, their core curriculum. 
Um, but when I encounter some concepts that I'm teaching them, and I realized that these are some concepts that um, I've never applied in my life, like in the real world, for example, um, I will tell the students that, right? Like for example, if it's an, an equation, like for example, econometrics, like proving the, the linear, like the, the, the coefficients, right? Your beta, right? Proving, proving your, your coefficients um, via OLS. Um, I tell them in the real world, no one really goes out and asks you to prove, prove those kind of stuff, right? Like um, for the purpose of the course, you need to know it. But in the real world, you just have your R, your Python, you have your, your linear regression packages, you type it in, the computer calculates it for you. So I tell them this kind of stuff. Um, so in a way, I, I, I share with them like um, my real world experiences and I tell them what are some of the things that they, that they will, on the contrary, if there are some concepts that um, that I'm going through that I do use very frequently in the real world. I will tell them that as well, right? And I feel that that is something that the students, they, they really appreciate it, um, at least based on the students' feedback. Um, so I, I tell them like some of the things that you actually use in the real world, some of the things that you wouldn't really use. Um, also for my conferences and which are generally more formal um, in nature, um, events, speeches and whatnot, um, I still believe it's important to, to be genuine right, in what you're presenting. Because ultimately, if you're presenting something that you don't even believe in yourself, I feel that it's very hard for, for you to bring your idea across, right? Like for, for me, when I give my presentations or whatnot, um, I always make it a point to present things that I personally believe in, right? That at, if it's like a math, math formula or whatnot, um, I need to be very certain like this is a formula that makes sense. Like for example, um, I feel that once I have that idea um, at the back of my mind, uh, thereafter, whatever they are sharing, like your body posture, your tone, even like the softer parts of stuff will, will start to flow out and the audience, they can really feel it. So that's why I feel like being genuine, believing in what you're sharing. I feel that that plays a big role in me being an effective presenter, I would say. So I think that's a great point, being genuine and believing in what you're saying and everything else will flow yeah, I guess everything else just flew. Mm. Essentially, I wanted to switch over to the financial aspect of your life. Mm. And I wanted to ask potentially, what is actual sciences? Mm. What is risk management? Because potentially many people watching this right now may not be so familiar with those c c concepts. So I wanted to ask, how does risk management actually vary from potentially an individual level to a corporate level to maybe even like a nation state level as you were saying in the start with your work with like the association of southeast asia and all these things like that so yeah yeah another great question i'll say i think there's two parts first is like why is actual science and then the risk management for an individual to like a corporate to like a to a like a national level or even a regional level like because we're working with the asean member states and whatnot it's a regional um, initiative so i guess what well, first like um briefly on what is actual science? Um, to it's a so if you complete your actual science degree, if you study actual science and if you complete all the necessary qualifications, exams and whatnot, um, you'll be called an actuary, right? Not an actual scientist or like one of my friends. Some of sometimes they say, so you are an actual scientist or so do you work with like uh, physics or what? No, it's basically math. Um, statistics and economics with coupled with risk management. So there's many different aspects for uh, about actual science. Um, so basically actual science, I would say is a um, diverse field where it takes like the core competencies of your math, stats, probability, distributions, um, risk management, um, and all those different methodologies, they merge it in together into a field that we call actual science. All right, and yeah, once you qualify, you pass. So it's similar to like your, for accountants, they have their ACCA exams or um, for the finance guys, they have their CFA exams, right? Um, which I, I think CFA, there's like three, three papers that you need to clear. Um, for actual science, it depends on the institute that you're taking at, but it ranges between, I guess, like maybe 14, 13, 14 to maybe like 16 exams. So it's a, it's a long journey, I would say. Uh, but once you pass everything, you can call yourself an actuary. And some of the jobs that actuaries do, uh, the traditional actuary work in an insurance company or reinsurance company, where they basically um, price insurance premiums, right? So that's one of the things that they do there. So for example, 
like when you buy oh, yeah so when you buy and sorry so when you buy an insurance policy from your insurance agent or whatnot um like for example they tell you if you passed away at age 65 they'll pay, pay you say maybe a million bucks for example um, then they say in order for this contract to to be valid you need to pay the insurance company say maybe a thousand dollars two thousand dollars um every year right but why is it a thousand dollars or why is it two thousand dollars right um with that you need an actuary to come in to model the mortality right the fluctuation in the underlying assets and whatnot um rate of growth and tell you okay so a thousand six hundred dollars is the optimal price that the company should be charging so that's something that the actuary does um, there are more non-traditional roles as well. Um, for example, um, if you guys have been following Elon Musk, right, Tesla, um, he actually put out a tweet, I think, mid of this year, I think, like several months back that he's actually looking for revolutionary actuaries. Quote, this is from Elon Musk, not from me. So I feel that there's definitely um, many different things that actuaries can do. I feel that he's hiring actuaries to price some kind of... Um, this is my speculation, right? That they are probably going for like, um, they announced that they will have self-driving cars on a subscription basis moving forward. And I feel like they are capturing a lot of information um, from, the, from the car, from the drivers and whatnot. And they may be thinking of um, providing an auto insurance for the drivers. And that's the reason why they are hiring for actuaries. And I feel um, so long as there's risk, um, I feel that a need to manage the risk exists and actuaries will always will be relevant in that in that case right yeah and next i would say um for risk management from an individual to a corporate level to a uh to to the national level so starting from an individual like you and me like um all of us i feel that a big part of um managing risk on an individual level um, we can look at it um generally from an ex ante and ex post right so ex ante risk management basically means like what are the things that you can do to mitigate the event from happening essentially, right? What are some of the things like, for example, um, if, you, if you are like, a, if you're driving, right? The risk of driving a car is to get into a car accident, right? That's, that's, that's the risk of something bad happening. And what you can do ex ante is um, like be more careful and don't drink and drive, right? And those kind of stuff. So that's an ex-ante way of looking at stuff. And from an exposed way, um, we have, it's a whole different way of looking at it, right? You have your, you can buy an insurance, for example, right? You can enter into contracts where given that a car accident does indeed happen, what are some of the things that you can do about it, right? So I feel that that level of mindset, um, risk management being both ex-ante and exposed can actually be replicated across the different levels. But of course, the magnitude of things will definitely be different. At a corporate level, um, a recent field of study that is um, increasingly increasingly important these days is uh, enterprise risk management. I, how do you have a holistic way to really manage the risk for an enterprise, for a big MNC, right? Having cross borders and whatnot. And that's definitely a very diverse topic because we can look at their ops, can look at their comms, can look at their, their business model, um, we can look at whether there are any legal risks, reputational risks on of the different investment projects that they are undertaking in. So there's a very diverse view and we always need like experts. Um, for example, for legal risks, um, you definitely need like um, consultations with like the general counsel, for example, to see whether there's anything um, risky about the, the project the company is undertaking. All right. But at the end of the day, I feel that it can still be framed within the ex ante and ex post framework, right? before an event occur, what are the things that you can do to manage the risk better, mitigate bad things from happening. And given that a bad thing did indeed happen, right? An event did occur, um, what are some of the mitigating measures that you can undertake to, to minimize the, the impact, right? The negative impacts. And of course, at the government level, again, it's also from an ex and an exposed way of looking at it. Um, for example, for catastrophe risk that we're working on, um, apart from just like um, having insurance, um, purchasing insurance, because for for big for for governments essentially, um, when they buy insurance, is a big undertaking as well. Um, we have like um, like financial instruments that we are thinking of, like catastrophe bonds, for example, right? That could potentially be a good 
exposed way of make, uh, mitigating the, the risk of catastrophes. Um, and ex ante, when you look at catastrophe, um, having more um, understanding of like the historical um, disasters that can potentially occur, knowing what can what is going to ultimately impact um, the, the society, the livelihood of your people, the quality of life. Um, that's another way that um, we should always be very concerned about and ensure that um, we have the right measures in place, be it from a policy, from the law, from the bills that you pass. Um, they should always have considerations of like the, the impact that they have on the people. And the risk of that is um, something that always needs to be managed by, by the stakeholders. Yeah. Maybe you could also touch a bit about what you do specifically at Risk Lighthouse in terms of your use of actuary science and risk management and everything. Yeah, that's a great point. So um, basically what we do is um, we advise the um, ASEAN member states, right? We That's three different pillars. The, the research project has three different pillars. Uh, we are tasked to um, lead the risk advisory pillar where we basically provide like, um, um, like we basically take the information right that has been uh, provided to us from risk assessment, um, how likely the, the country is um, going to have an, uh, a flood, right, an earthquake, for example. And based on that, based on the, the we call that a, the accidents probability curve, right, the probability of um, a loss exceeding a certain amount occurring, uh, what are some of the things that the government can actually do, right, um, to better mitigate the risk? So some of the, and this kind of advice, it varies from country to country. There's no one size fit all. And we are still in the process of um, gathering information. Uh, but to give you an example of um, something successful that has been done, I um, can't remember if it's the Florida or if it's the California. Um, they have this, if I remember correctly, it's hurricane, hurricane fund, right? Where every year, what happens is that the government, they actually put in some money into the fund Right. It's a very, very basic concept, right? But to get it passed through the abuse and whatnot, that's, that's the big undertaking. But essentially, they got it passed. So um, every year, they put in some amount of money, right? Um, I think over the past 20 years, or I, I can't remember the exact figures, um, what happened in the end is um, ideally, the amount that the government put in at the start, um, it will start to accumulate an amount. And when the disaster strike, they can draw down on the fund to ensure that um, they have the finances, right, to, to ensure a speedy recovery, right, um, after the hurricane has struck. So what an actuary do uh, in this case is, how much money does the government, should the government put in like every year? Should it be like 10 million, 50 million, 100 million? If you put in too little, um, when the disaster strike, you'll be back to square zero. You don't have sufficient funds to ensure speedy recovery. If you put in too much, um, if you put in too much, then it creates like a strain on a government resource where um, the excess amount could actually have been spent on like um, improving um, public infrastructure and other um, necessities for the people. So what an actuary do um, is that we can come in and help them calculate what's that optimal amount, which if you look at it is um, similar in concept of an actuary at a traditional insurance company. So it's um, pricing of the risk essentially. If I can put it in one line, I say, um, putting a price on the risk, that might be a key feature of um, what actuaries do. Um, that may be oversimplifying things because actuaries do many stuff, but that's one key thing that we, we do. So um, we help them calculate what's the amount that they should put in every year, whether there's a need to increase the amount year over year, depending on um, changes in circumstance. Because of course, we don't expect things to remain the same for the next 20 years. What we do is we make best assumptions and we run models, simulations, and based on that, we come out with like the optimal number um, on the yearly basis. So that, that's something that has been done. And the result of that is that it's been very successful. Um, so far, the amounts that they are drawing and amounts that they're putting in is on a fairly level basis. So that's a very successful um, case study. Um, of course, around the world, there's some other examples um, that uh, may not be as successful as that, uh, but we shall go there. I guess you can Google if you're interested. Um, I can't remember if it's Florida or California, but yeah, it's one of the states and one of the city in the US, but yeah. 
Right. So um, mm. go, I just wanted to shift back into the actual like financial aspect of your life again. Right. And so if I'm not wrong, so your PhD, which you took at the Nanyang Technological Institution, if I'm not University, wrong, University, yeah. University, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, there is, was yeah. the fastest PhD in the history of that course. Is that, is that, is that right? Yeah, thankfully. Uh, so on average, uh, uh, students graduate in like four to five years. Um, some take six years or more. Um, I was, um, yeah, I, I would say I was, I was very lucky, very blessed. Yeah, so I've completed it in about three years. Awesome. Yeah. And so like with that, I just wanted to ask you as well. I mean, firstly, how did you complete it in such a short amount of time? Mm. And then secondly, I'd like to follow on from that and really talk about the actual, you know, idea of, a PhD. I feel many mm. students are reluctant to take a PhD because of the opportunity cost of time, whereby mm. you could be spending those, you know, four, five, six years doing something else with your life. So I wanted to ask you all, firstly, how did you complete it in such a short time? And secondly, do you think it was worth that entire time? Okay. Yeah, another great question as well. Like, um, I'm getting very amazed by all the great questions that you guys have, have planned. So, yeah. Anyway, so, um, how did I manage to complete it? Um, I think first of all, I worked hard, right? Um, if I hadn't worked as hard, probably wouldn't have been possible. Um, but to be frank, I think um, luck played a part as well. Um, so let me separate it into two parts. First, uh, hard work. Um, for me, I actually had, and so for most students, when they do a PhD, they um, they apply for a PhD program, uh, then they go through an interview, they get an acceptance, and in the first 12 to 18 months, they take coursework, right? They, they attend classes where the professors teach them like some PhD-related um, courses, right? At the end of the 12 to 18 months, depending on your institution, um, or even like two years for some, uh, you take what we call a qualifying exam, QE, um, if you pass it, you'll be, I think the term they call it is that you'll be a doctoral candidate where you like officially start doing your research and whatnot. And um, depending on the school's requirement, once you complete a given number of publications of, of papers that you have written, um, you go through a final oral exam and which can take maybe from like two, three, four years, right? For example. So when you add both together, that's why most, most students graduate in like four or five or six years even. Um, for me, um, I actually did my bachelor's at NTU as well. And I, for me, I think I was quite lucky in a way where I actually had, for most students, right, they, when they apply for a PhD program, they do not really know um, what research topic that they want to work on, right? Sometimes they have a supervisor, supervisor give them some comments. For some other students, they have some kind of idea, uh, but when they do a PhD program, um, because of the coursework, they kind of get distracted in a way. For me, I think I was lucky in a way where I've always had an idea that I want to work on. And that was actually the reason why I did a PhD in the first place, which I'll share more about later. But for me, I feel that I have an idea of a research topic that I want to work on. And because of that, I have actually started working on the research topic. Um, I started in like the final year of my undergraduate on my own before I even got accepted into the PhD program. And even during the coursework where all my classmates and I were doing like the courses and everything, simultaneously, I was also working on the research topic. So that's the hard work, I guess, like um, overloading in a, in, a, in a way. And thankfully, the, the research um, yielded like positive results in a way. And um, that formed the basis for like my, and that fulfilled the graduation requirement, essentially. So I'm really thankful for that. So in a nutshell, uh, I worked hard, I overloaded, I started before while everyone else was like working like on the coursework, I did like both, right, on my own. And I was lucky that I had that idea and I was lucky that it worked out fine. So yeah, there's many different factors, I would say. And why did I do a PhD and do I feel that it was worth it? Um, answer is yes, yes, right, uh, obviously. I, but I would say essentially, um, doing a PhD, I feel it's a commitment, right? You really don't do a PhD for the money. You don't do a PhD for, for like any, all that stuff. When I was an undergrad, I received job offers from like big companies um, who, who basically were willing to pay me like a lot more, right? But that 
uh, if it if money if um you're motivated by like um money or whatnot, I don't think doing a PhD is the best way, um, the best spend of your time, and that may be a reason why, um, yeah. Anyway, so coming back, uh, so do I regret doing a PhD or why did I do a PhD? It's actually intricately linked. So my research topic, um, is actually on like um, like. Like more ethical decision making um, by managers, right? So for me, um, when I was growing up, uh, I I I I lived through like the subprime mortgage crisis, right? Two thousand nine. Um, the the impact of that on me, um, yeah, it left an impact on me when I saw like um, uh, when I read the news, I was following the news, I was following it very closely. And I saw like at the end of the day, some of the consequence that was meted out, um, I felt that it was, um, um, it could have been different. I feel that it could be, have been a, a bit more harsh, for example, right? Um, cause many people lost their homes, right? Real, real people around the world. So um, what I felt is like, at that point in time, I had this idea of um, how, to, how to make managers be, better managers in a better in the sense of being more ethical or making decisions that is better for the people. Right. So I had this research idea. Um, and at that point in time, it was a very simple idea when I was younger, but as I grew up, it started to like form, um, before I go to sleep at night, I keep thinking about stuff, like those kinds of things. So, um, so essentially I had that idea, um, but to really implement the idea in the real world, um, it will take a lot of resource. Um, you need someone in like high position, someone, um, and I feel that for me to implement it per se, um, it'll take a lot of um, effort. All right. So I feel that a more efficient way of going about it is I share the idea. What's the simplest way to share an idea with the world? I feel that it's through pub, um, publishing it, right, in an academic journal, um, sharing the idea with the world. Um, and that's the reason why I actually did a PhD in the first place, right? It's not for the money. It's not for one. I just felt that like I was given this idea. Um, I was lucky enough to be given this idea. And the least I could do is to share this idea with the world. So that's essentially the reason why I did a PhD. I feel that that's the fastest path to sharing this idea um, with the world. And yeah, that's the reason why I did a PhD. And did I regret it? Um, no, because um, I think I fulfilled my objective in the first place is to share this idea um, with, with people around the world. So yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think I regret it. And, and I'm actually, I really, uh, of course, it's hard, right? I, I feel that doing a PhD is probably one of the most mentally challenging, uh, intellectually challenging things that I've done um, thus far. But at the same time, I feel that um, at the same time, I feel that it has given me like um, it has taught me some kind of resilience that I'm able to achieve. Like I'm able to go through something so hard. So when something difficult comes up again at a later time, I feel that I've already done something that's so difficult. Wherever I meet any challenges along the way, I'll be like. All oh, right, it, it shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't be a problem. And this is something that I've actually learned um, while I was serving my national service as well. Like that was like more physically challenging stuff or whatnot. Uh, but I feel that it all comes back together. All right. Like um, when you have done something that's tough, right, it builds a mental resilience in yourself such that in the future, when you meet something that is just as tough, or you'll be like, I've done it before, I can do it again. And that is something that I like to share with like all the all the um, maybe like listeners or viewers of this podcast is um, don't be afraid, right, um, of taking on challenges, right? That's the best way that you can grow. Yeah. So, yeah. Before we end this mm. interview, we'd like to end with one final question. And that is, if you have a piece of advice for any of the youth listening, what would that one piece of advice be? Right. Uh, right. I have many pieces. Like for my classes, I always share like several... At the end of every class, I have like a list of like ten to twelve things. Some of it, some of it are quotes from our, from our, from leaders, right? From our um, uh, late founding father Lee Kuan Yew, um, from IBM um, Chairman Ginny Romati. But anyway, coming back, one quote that I would share personally, I would say, um, oh, that's a thing. probably given that what we are uh, doing now it's really about giving back so i'll say okay yeah okay i might think a bit too long on this uh <laughs> right anyway uh okay maybe something that i, I share with my students right um at 
given that the demographics of the listeners are probably like more students or whatnot, I feel like, um, especially in an Asian country, a lot of us are, um, you're not determined by your grades, right? Or your qualifications or, or even your occupation, right? Uh, but fundamentally, I feel like you are defined by how you are as a person and your character. And yeah, maybe that, that, that would be something that's more suitable. Yeah. That makes sense. Thank you so much for all your insights and for taking time out sure. this morning to spend with us. Okay, for sure. Yeah, it's been a great pleasure. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, Sham and Jonathan, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening in. This podcast has been brought to you by Desera, a platform designed to bridge the gap between the youth and professional. You can read more about us at desera.org. And you can also check out the section titled Insights with Experts, where you can submit your questions that you might have for future experts and industries that you would like to learn more about. And you can also refer in any experts that you might know yourself.